Right, thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, in fact, when I first entitled this talk, it was The Pleasures and the Pain, Women in Science. And then I decided that's really giving a message that I don't want to convey today, because this is how my day starts. So I wake up in the morning, I go down, make a cup of tea, go back to bed, lie there, and I think about all the fun things I'm going to have ahead of me. And, and I think that's an incredibly privileged position to be in in your working environment. You know, to wake up each day and be excited about the work ahead of you is actually an absolute honour. Um, so that's a message I really want to get across. So there's, there is a huge amount of joys in my work, but there's definitely a lot of juggles as well. Uh, and those bring their own issues. Um, I'm a hepatologist. I look after um, uh, individuals at the John Radcliffe Hospital who have got liver issues. I'm an academic. I'm a wife and a mum to two children. Adam and Clara, aged 12 and 8. I got a couple of pictures of those later on. Okay. So I've been interested in hepatitis C virus for a very long time. And it's really based on this. After, after individuals become acutely infected, about 80% go on to resolve, to get persistent infection, while 20% resolve infection. And we've come to understand that the nature of the T cell response crucially determines which of those two pathways a patient goes down. And um, when I did my PhD, that was the issue that I was looking at in the lab. And over the last three or four years, we've tried to harness that and to move that to actually engineer a T-cell vaccine to prevent hepatitis C virus infection. And we're using adenoviral vectors that are, aren't able to um, reproduce themselves, and they host the entire non-structural proteins of hepatitis C from a genotype 1B strain. And uh, what we've been able to do is experimental phase one um, experiments, which have been really exciting for me. It's moving from the lab into patient studies really for the first time. It's been a whole new kind of learning curve, and I found that really exciting. And as a group have kind of moved along um, with me as, as, as we've evolved. And we started off using two different heterologous adenoviral vectors, very nice response to the priming vaccination and attenuated response to the boosting vaccination. And then we replace the um, heterologous adeno with an MVA vector here, and now we've got very nice boosting responses. So quite exciting data, just came out last, last year, um, and it's been lots and lots of fun in you know, establishing this and moving it forward from the lab into patient populations. And one of the issues around hepatitis C is the, enormal, is the enormous um, uh, mm. viral diversity. There's seven major HCV strains, and you can see here, if you just look at one single strain here, there's as much diversity there within one strain as there is within the, H the whole of the HIV viral quasi-species. So, so that brings, um, you know, enormous challenges. Um, and so to get around this, we're now trying to engineer vaccines where which, which, which can attack all of the different HCV strains, and that's what I'm working on at the moment, and that's what the MRC is funding me to do. So that's one major part of my work. The other major part of my work is this. It's, um, I'm leading at the moment a £5 million award from the MRC um, to, to, to understand why some individuals respond to HCV therapies and others aren't able to. It's called Stop HCV. It stands for Stratified Medicine to Optimise Patient Outcomes. Um, and there's 22 partners involved um, from academia, industry, uh, and, and this, is, this is the first major you know, leadership thing that I've really been um, asked to, asked to um, take part in, and it's, and it's a big consortium. Um, and what we are aiming to do is integrate viral sequencing, host genetics, and lots of that's been done at the Wellcome Trust Centre here, uh, and integrate all of, all of those things for the very first time. Uh, and the third thing is this, B-cell Im Im immunology and IgG4 systemic disease. Emma is there in the audience. She's taken the lead on this with me. But what we're trying to do is understand why some individuals have got um, an excessive amount of IgG4 producing B-cells, and that leads to organ dysfunction. So really, I've got three big things I'm currently trying to 
work through, at the moment, three kind of major projects. Okay, so how did I get to be quite this you know, busy, which is, which is how it feels right now? Um, I, um, I started medicine in London uh, back in the mid-1980s. Um, and actually, medicine to me was not so interesting. Medicine to me was a lot of negatively marked MCQs at that point, uh, along with rote learning around anatomy and you know, biochemistry, and it wasn't enormously exciting. Um, and I left in the fifth year, and I went off and I did anthropology. That was lots of fun, but I did come back after that, um, and I moved <coughs> on, and I became uh, an SHO in, in North London, um, you know, again. And I did that for two and a half years, and then I left, and I went... Uh, on an expedition for eight months to the Arctic, and that was great fun as the expedition doctor, and to the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. Uh, so that was really fun. And uh, after that, I um, returned, and um, I became a registrar on a three-year post in infectious disease and microbiology at the Hammersmith Hospital. And after four months, I decided this was not the job for me either, and I resigned from that after four months. So you can see, for me, it took me quite a long time to get to find something... I really wanted to do, and that's where I am today. But there were quite a lot of, you know, early risks that I felt I had to take and step off the, you know, the kind of inevitable treadmill, which is, which is how, you know, lots of us find ourselves, I think. Um, and, and, and it was only really when I became a registrar working at the Royal Free Hospital that actually medicine became really exciting for the first time for me, because here there was a really dedicated group of individuals, the medicine was fantastic, academia was, was, was you know, utmost there, um, and work became very, very exciting for the first time there. And it became obvious then that actually what, what I most enjoyed was looking at things in immense depth, really, so rather than the breadth, I liked, you know, I liked, you know, the depth, uh, and, and, and it was that, you know, royal free liver, transplant job where that first became evident to me uh, in my working life. Okay, so after that, it looks like a nice CV, really. I was funded by the MRC. I got um, um, a one-year research award five years ago, my um, intermediate fellowship here, and last year, the, um, this, this award here. But, but actually... Um, what that doesn't highlight is all the things that I have actually failed to get as I've gone along. And this is, this, th th you know, this is the problem with, with um, success. It's not always as straightforward as it might look. So these are the things I failed to get along that career pathway. Uh, I've repeatedly not been interviewed by the Wellcome Trust. I've had papers rejected. All of us do. That's really tough when you first start out. I've been interviewed for intermediate awards and I haven't achieved those. I've been inter interviewed for NIHL professorship, I didn't get that. I've had grants rejected and last, week, last, last year I had to give up two holidays, you know, family holidays when I was grant writing and, you know, family holidays for me are very precious times. So it was Winston Churchill who actu actually said, success is actually meeting failure after failure with a degree of enthusiasm. <laughs> And to be successful, I think, I think you've got to accept that, that you're going to get knocks as well as, as, well as successes. Um, I had my first kid, Adam, here, um, right in the middle of my PhD, and the next one here, um, my next child here, um, just before my intermediate MRC award. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's been hard. Um, but, but the rewards are absolutely enormous. I feel interested, every, you, know, you know, day after you know, day works, you know, interesting. And I'm, uh, and you, you know, just being able to wake up and think, what am I, what am I gonna, what am I gonna, you know, do today? That's, that's up, up to me and nobody else is actually like, you know, gold dust really, you know, to me. So why aren't more people doing this? You know, why aren't women doing this? Well, they do to start off with. So this is, this is what the career structures look like for men and women. Um, we've had equal numbers of men and women entering into um, undergraduate degree level 
since probably 1985. In fact, I think now there's more women than men. Uh, and the same here when you move up to lethal <coughs> level. But it's at this point here we see a sudden you know, drop off. Um, and I don't know what the audience thinks the reasons for that are. Does anybody like to, to, to raise some suggestions here as to, as to why they think that happens? Um, I mean, personally, I think that what happens here is a whole lot of stuff happens at once and we're all very time constrained. So everything is pushed into this, you know, window. Um, and the major things still are that women do most of the housework at home. Women do, do two thirds of the housework and women take the maternity leave. Um, and that means you're just there for less hours. That means that, that you aren't able to put in the hours. And your self-esteem can actually, you know, drop off, I think, as a result of that. And you don't push yourself out there because your self-esteem has dropped, because you're not able to be there quite as much. So I think what we need to be aiming for is a fairer, equal, more, more even society. And that would be of advantage to everyone, I think, men and, and you know, women. Everybody would you know, benefit from that, where we could all have a good working day and then spend you know, good time at home with our offspring and kids and husband. Um, and that's what we should be aiming for, I think. Supportive partners, very important. You don't have to have one to be successful, but if you've got one, I think they need to be supportive. And your kids as well. Your kids need to understand that you're a working mum and they should help you at home to some extent. Internet shopping. I've got a 12-year-old boy. He does the internet shopping at home. <laughs> you know, it's you know, computer-based. He ordered from Sainsbury's last night. It'll come this evening. He loves it. Get your kids to do the shopping for you. And he does the recycling. You know, computer-based home support. It's... It's, you know, it works very, very well. And pay for help. Women need to pay for help at home. If you can afford to. Not everybody can, but if you can afford to pay for help, pay for help at home. And then flexible working, absolutely essential. I've always worked in a flexible way. I've never worked full-time until this year. I've worked 80%. And um, I've needed half days. I've needed whole days off. I've needed blocks off. I took four months maternity leave with my first kid and I took 12 months in my second. I had proper maternity leave. Um, so ask, ask. If you need to you know, work in that kind of way, ask. And I think you know, today at Oxford, on the whole, people will say yes if you ask to work in a flexible kind of way. So the other thing I think is really important is to look after yourself, all right? Life, life is very, very long. And I hope I'm still going to be working when I'm 80 years old. That's, that's almost 40 years from now. And if you're going to hang in there for 40 years, you've got to look after yourself and you've got to not be working the whole time. And we have fantastic holidays. We go to the hills. I don't take the internet with me. I don't have a mobile phone. And surprise, surprise, nobody misses me. Everyone thinks they're indispensable, but you find that when you go and you leave your group behind, you're not indispensable and people will you know, rise up and do the work for you. So take proper holidays and don't take your mobile and don't take the internet with you when you go off with your kids. I think that's really important. And, and you can actually plan what's the important things in life on a holiday like that. What am I going to achieve next year? Give yourself the mental space to decide what's important moving forward. I think that's really, really important. Whereas if you're just in a constant frantic run, you, you know, day after day, week after week, you can't really prioritise you know, what's the important things that you need to be achieving in the next year. Okay, so my advice is to lean in. This is not my, my phrase. This is Cheryl Sandberg, and it was actually Caitlin in the audience introduced me to this um, recently. She's the Facebook Chief Operating Officer. Lean in means, means work very hard and go for what you want up until the point when you have your first offspring, and then you can lean back if you want to. But if you lean back years beforehand, because you may be having offspring five, six years from now, it's a self-perpetuating cycle, and you'll find yourself in work that's, that's not interesting, and therefore you won't want to come back to work. So, you know, hang in there and, you know, push on until you have to step back, really. And I think that, that part of, of, of her, you know, philosophy is actually good. Uh, there's other bits that are more controversial, but I think that's, that's a very useful message. Once you've got your kids, I think you just have to hang in there and have the confidence to hang on, really, as best you can. It's an exhausting time when your kids are very little. It's really, really tiring. But hang in there, and as they get older, then, then after that, you can then you know, push up again. Uh, get them internet shopping for you. Recognise the issues, know what your rights are, and seek practical, 
solutions, and those include the Athena Swan Initiative at Oxford. It's been fantastic for Oxford. There's a whole shift in the last 18 months, I think, about how, how we're trying to find um, solution, solutions, and that's, that's down to the Athena Swan Initiative to some extent. Mentorship's really important, and we should be holding lunchtime lectures like this rather than evening lectures at 6 o'clock when we have to go home and look after kids at home. Uh, and mostly those things seem to be happening now at Oxford, and that's fantastic. Okay, so what I would say is everyone has knocks. It's how you react to them that matters. And actually remembering that I find really, really useful. If, if, if you have a knock, remember it's your reaction to that that really counts. Um, it's, it's easier for men still, but if you look after yourself, hang in there. Remember, life is very long, and I think it's an incredibly rewarding career uh, if you're able to do that. So do it. Okay, thanks.